fam, it's bad. It was like a fist, a fist, and it was radio and a speaker and a headphone. Don't let the radio tell you what to listen to. <laughs> yes, that's it. Um, hosted DJ Cool Herc, Public Enemy, LL Cool J, you know, all these. And then Omar Offendim, Narsi, Shadia Mansoor, <laughs> Loki. I had them on the show. The people who started it all. The off. first year, yeah. Producers, graffiti artists, breakers, hip hop culture, but Arabi. Come, I'll show you what do we have as Arabs. This is an empire. Stories of exceptional Arabs around the world and their journey to the top. Hi guys, I'm Hiba Fisher, the co-host of El Empire. Um, and today I am so honored to be sitting with the legendary Hassan, uh, who's a beautiful, beautiful soul. Um, and he goes by the stage name of Big Hass. Welcome to El Empire. Salam alaikum, peace, <laughs> peace. What a huge honor. I just want to say this is a big mi- milestone for me. KC has been um, representing us for quite some time right now. I'm very proud of you, what you guys do. And uh Let's go. Now we're on it. Thank you, Hass. Um, okay. Can you introduce yourself? Human being that <laughs> believes in good, authentic art and vibe. I am a, uh, I'm a servant of the uh, independent um, artist. I'm a servant of hip hop culture. Uh, I'm from Saudi Arabia, Jeddah, to be exact, my hometown. And uh, I host uh, Saudi's first and only FM hip hop radio show called Les Hip Hop. Um, I have a blog. I um, called Revolt, uh, a magazine. Uh, most importantly, though, I'll say this. I'm a, a husband to a beautiful lady, um, my one and only, and a father uh, to um, um, Ahmed, who's my son, who happens to be autistic, who's my hero. That's definitely like the biggest thing I have for sure. That's beautiful. Um, and uh, do you have any morning routines? Wow. What, morning do you routines. Do, what do you do if you have one? What do you do? Interesting. Um uh, to be honest with you, I think it's uh, it evolved throughout um, my, my routine because um, I've done a lot of digging in my life, um, and because what I do there was there was there was no like manual for that. So most of the work I used to do was like late night, early morning, where I used to dig because I used to work in sales. And um, you used to work in sales. I used to work in sales. I oh, I can't wait ads. to get to that. Oh man, yeah, I used to sell ads and. Uh, you know, and um, I got into what I got into with um, elevation of mind through music and it hit me. And so most of my research actually and my digging happens early in the morning, like 1 a.m. to 5, 6 a.m. It's just been crazy. When and do you sleep, sir? That's what I'm saying. So it's 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 been, it's, it's look, it's a lot of digging. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's just sometimes because I really love what I do. And um, those early hours of the morning, I used to, because I didn't know anything about um, about this, especially when I first got into it. Um, about hip hop or about sales? About, no, about like, you know, about this um, getting into blogging and discovering um, Arabic hip hop back in, in 2008. And so the routine has changed, uh, you know, um, you know, obviously after we had uh, Ahmed as well, routine has changed. So, and because he's autistic, it's also different. You see, there's a lot of layers to it. So, Zubda, as we say, uh, the butter, uh, which is the sum up for this. I don't have an actual routine. It's just always really ad hoc every, every single, like really every single day. It's been like that. So it's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, but I'm rolling with it. It's the same for me. I have no morning routine. They say like it's a practice of a successful person. And I'm like, well, I don't have that. So I love that you said that. <laughs> yeah. What is uh, one of your favorite things to do with your son, Ahmed? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, look, listen, this is going to... So autism is, you know, obviously it's, uh, you know, a lot of people, and I, I get a lot of heat for that. They think it's a disease. Now, I, I, I'm not saying this because he's my son, but I don't think it's a disease. It's more like it's a disorder maybe, or is a spectrum, it's a big spectrum. Um, so there's a lot of things that uh, we do that are like one-on-one, um, uh, you know, me and, and my wife with him as well. Um, we do a lot of the uh, so-called practice or like actions in when we go out to the mall, for example. And he's been getting better slowly, slowly. So the reason why I moved, I relocated from Jeddah to Dubai was because obviously back then in Jeddah, uh, four years and a half ago, there wasn't the same kind of vibe and energy. I'm not talking institutions. I'm talking the vibe of the people. And uh, it wasn't, I, I, it's not, it wasn't going to work out with him. Um, and because the UAE is a melting pot of different nationalities and 
um, I, I thought it's a, it's a good move um, for us. So a lot of things we, 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 we play together. Uh, um, he recently got into shooting hoops, which is really interesting for you me. You play basketball. I love basketball yeah. as a life. Like for me is, yeah. And and to see that, for him doing that. So yeah, we do a lot of work. He likes printing and he likes looking at tech things right now. Um, he likes printing. What do you printing mean? Printing papers and stuff like that. And getting into the printing, the, the printer element of things. When we go to a place. That's so cool. He likes to see how, where the cartridge goes and I'm like, oh, okay. And for a lot of people, it's a bit weird. So in the beginning, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it was very hard to... Um, because a lot of people would look and give us really bad looks and it was very hard in the beginning for us, but then we got used to it and we we, we, we got strong. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of things, like there's nothing that I don't do. Like I'm really a family, uh, I'm a family person. A lot of people would, would think uh, otherwise, but really it's, it, family comes first always. So work, come back, research, family, it's, it's always been like that, you know, so yeah. I think that's the best way to live life. How old is Ahmed? Uh, he's turning 12 now, end of the year. MashaAllah. Uh, which is massive, alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, so tell me about uh, where where were you born? Mm. Uh, Jeddah. Uh, you know, obviously, um, Saudi Arabia. My, my, my parents are originally from Medina. Um, so you're, you're full Saudi. Yeah. Which is, uh, for a lot of people, um, they, they, they really... Uh, they confuse that like as how how are you a blue eyed Saudi? I'm like we exist. We have a tribe. <laughs> We're the blue eyed Saudis. We exist. It's true. Um, Do your parents have blue eyes? The, I, my grandma had. Mm. Uh, my grandma had. Um, so I, I come from from this background. My dad was a commercial lawyer. Uh, my mom, um, uh, you know, she she used to write incredible like in in Arabic, an amazing writer. Um, yeah, you know, so uh, Jeddah, Jeddah is definitely home, but uh, after moving and obviously for my son, and it's 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 just the concept of home is sometimes gets blurred, to be honest, you know, because, um, and I think a lot of people, especially on KC right here, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think all of us are kind of mutts. What was uh, growing up for you like? Can you describe your childhood? Mm. And, and you grew up in Jeddah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh no one has ever asked me that question. Um, um, <clears throat> so I studied in uh, Lanjal School, which is a, a Saudi private school. We didn't have English. I learned English at the age of 15. I'll tell you how that came up. Um, uh, I would say it's a, a loving childhood. Like, you know, my, my father, who was uh, my best friend, uh, passed away in 2005. Uh, yeah, that that was definitely a big blow. But subhanAllah, and I'll talk about maybe li that later, but when, when he passed away, God really gave me a source of power somehow, some way. I don't know how I got the, the power to even, because I was the only source of uh, uh, kind of income slash also just being to, to rely on. Are you, uh, the, are you a single uh, child? Uh, no, I mean, at that point when he passed away, my brother and sister, they were a bit younger. and But the, the moment he actually... Um, You're the eldest. Yeah, well, the moment yeah. he passed away, I remember we were all together and um, it was really crazy how all of a sudden like we heard and then got my mom, my brother and sister all together under me, like we're all like on the ground and it felt like we're going to be okay. I don't know how God gave me that power. And two or three hours later, I just let it out it's alone. Uh, it's, it's just crazy. So I think about that a lot. Going back to your question, very loving childhood. My father was... Uh, uh, seriously, everyone says that about, you know, sometimes their, their, their dad, but my father was like, seriously, one incredible human being. The only thing he didn't see what I was able to accomplish um, in terms of blogging, launching a hip hop radio show, having a beautiful son and a wife. And um, so that, that sometimes kind of uh, puts me down. But yeah, loving childhood, incredible father, amazing mom, and just a, a beautiful space um, where we at, uh, we were very, we were living in Saudi Arabia, which is considered one of the most conservative countries in the world. And my dad always taught with action more than words. Um, I don't know if I have time to say a couple of examples. We have all the time. Amazing. My God. Um, so for example, like, so I've never, this is going to shock a lot of people. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. Neither have I. Amazing. <laughs> wow. But I've smoked a cigar. Okay. Uh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, and a lot of people ask me why. And my, my father, when I was like about 13, 14 or 15, I think, sat me down and said, do you smoke? And I'm like, oh, wow. I'm like, no, I don't. He's like, if you ever wanted to smoke, 
make sure you yourself go to the store and buy it. I'm like, what is that approach? That's thinking about it now. Later on down the line, you know, I realized and then al mamnu' marghub, like whatever is prohibited is like wanted. So he took that approach to say, I'm cool. It worked with me. It might not work with any other <laughs> person. I don't know. So I never really got into that. So the, the, the way the way he was like kind of really educating me about life was really uh, through that. Um, even at one point, I remember coming back from school one day and I saw my mom just having a good time dancing and stuff. I said, yo, music is forbidden. You can't do that. And my father was like, Let's sit down. Let's have a conversation about that. That's what I was learning from school, right? Yeah. And that's what people need to realize. Sometimes you learn things from school and you come back. Remember, it was a Saudi um, at that point, um, as a as a Saudi, Saudis were not allowed to go to international schools. It was not like in the law. You have to stick to, now the law has changed. So he had a conversation with me. And it's just interesting. A lot of these, uh, you know, he talked to me about the importance. We have a sister about the importance of loving, uh, you know, uh, you know, and respecting women in the household. And how is that very important that she sees love from within. I think this is a very important, and as I grew, I realized the importance of that. Um, yeah, and there a lot of these things, like, you know, it's gonna be all about, it's all life. Um, and obviously I'm 42 right now, and you realize all these lessons were learned, you know, from him. He sounds incredible. What, yeah, what, what, okay. what Rest was... in peace, Ahmed Yahya Dinawi. He's, he's um, yeah, he's, uh, oh man, yeah. Don't get me emotional in case you end. <laughs> <laughs> what was your what is what is your mom like? What is oh man? Describe describe um, your mother son. to you. Yeah, uh, my mom married really really young, so we were like best friends. We used to watch cartoons together. Apparently, like you know, um, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, um, she she's someone that took on a role of uh, father and and mom and parent uh, when my dad passed away. So the, the the pressure that she had, I think my mom, um, she's someone I can talk to about anything, like anything. And she's always, uh, uh, you know, she's, because she knows that we're into, like I'm into sports and basketball and hip hop. She always liked to research things and like tell me things and send me things like, did you know about this? Like, yeah, yeah, mom, I'm interviewing that guy. So um, yeah, incredible human being as well. Um, but life teaches you things sometimes. For example, my mom um, didn't meet her father. Uh, my grandfather passed away when she was like two. Like she doesn't even remember him. And then I, you know, I got into life and I got into basketball. And one of the most incredible moments was when Michael Jordan's father passed away. He said this, this quote that also impacted me. He said something along the lines of, uh, you know, my father passed away, but I was able to spend 25 years with him. Th that really impacted me. I really love basketball. So like quotes from that, like that really impacts me. For example, my mom don't even have a memory of her father. I do. Some people don't even know their father, you know? So it's the whole thing about, you know, just trying to take the best out of, uh, you know, something. And so uh, I respect my mom so much and uh, she's always holding it down. And, uh, you know, I just want to make her proud. Sometimes doing what we do, some people don't understand, like, what do you mean you're a blogger? And what? hip hop radio host, what, what, what is it, you know, how you're making money out of that. And alhamdulillah, you know, it was a struggle, but we reached. What, um, I, I, I want to get to that in more detail, but just quickly uh, about, um, about that kind of social commentary about what you do. How, did you ever have a conversation with your mom when you decided to pursue music as a career? No, <laughs> no, seriously, that, 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 that was like, this is why this is an incredible kind of even let, let out for me because I finished school, I went to university. Uh, in the in the first year of university, my father got sick. So I had to quit university as a freshman and start working. Family comes first. I worked three jobs a day. I uh, used to sell phones, worked in a uh, fast food uh, place. We used to sell perfumes, you know, just to make a living at that point. It was- This is in Jeddah? This is in Jeddah, yeah. I had to leave. Um, Cause my father got really sick and ill and um, you know, and uh, my brother and sister studied, uh, studied um, hotel management. And we ha I had to also, um, you know, make sure that their um, uh, education goes on. So yeah, it's just thinking about it right now is really, you know, tough times. But no, I think I got into it because my mind changed in 2008, that night, boom, Arabic hip hop. Mm -hmm. Wow. Revolt. Poof. How did you, so when you, when you started, um, 
to to pursue music full time um, with the blogging, with the radio station that came later, and then production now. What would your mom tell her friends that her son did? Mm, great question. Great question. Yeah, for for us, it's it's like a radio host thing. Like you know, he does he does he supports independent artists. He supports the underdogs. He supports. So it's, it's that's it's, awesome. That yeah. She says that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. amazing. You know, like she she uh, you know she she likes that. She doesn't maybe fully understand the scope of it, but she understands the whole thing about supporting the the underdog and giving a voice. That's amazing. I think it took me five years to get my mom to <laughs> know what it is that I do for a living. Um, and I well, love you know, my I, mother I can very say, much. Mama, she's doing a great job impacting people. <laughs> um, what what role did music play uh, growing up for you when in your, you know, when you were 10, 12, 13, 14, your teens? What, what was there music in the households? What, what, and what kind of music did you listen to? To be honest, nothing. In the beginning, early on, that's what I'm saying. We were, we were fed music on the, whatever we listened on. At that point, there was only one radio station that played only certain kind of music. And there was an American force radio station that we used to listen to that played some English music. Uh, I'm an 80s kid, obviously, not, you know, so I was born in 1980, but the, the whole MTV era came through, yeah. I, but I didn't get into it. Until like to the to the, to be honest, like this is what it what it was. I used to listen to what my dad used to listen to, which is Talab and, and Fair, he loved Fairuz, Abdul Halim, <laughs> you know, like uh, um, you know all, all all these incredible, of course, you know, artists. So that was the vibe in the house. If if you're asking about that, that was the vibe um, in the house, and he liked poetry a lot. He used to, my mom and dad used to kind of battle. Cause uh, she was, cause she's a writer. She's a writer. She loves yeah. poetry. And they used to like the whole, they used to do the play that game. I remember like they, he'd say a bar and then the last letter in that bar, she has to come up with something with beginning with that letter. And we used to be like, Whoa, wow. That's so cool. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I wasn't into that early on, to be honest. But then subhanAllah, fast forward 2008, I'm all about rhythm and poetry. I'm all about like, you know, rap, which is, you know, again, hip hop culture. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. So you studied business administration and management in school. Where did you go to university? Yeah, that's, uh, so I finished high school, uh, international school of Shui Fat. I, I did charger and then moved to Beirut. I studied Wait, wait, there. hold on, hold yeah. on. So I know that your dad sent you to Sharjah to study English when yes. you were 15. Yeah. That was away from the family. You were by yourself. No, he moved. He moved. Oh, us. So the whole family moved to Sharjah. Because one day, I don't know if I said this story before, but one day, my father walked in and he's like, you know, I had curly hair and he's like, he's, he's really like, you're getting just, you know, kind of fatter and stupider like this in a way. And I'm like, why? <laughs> he's like, you don't, you don't know any English. And that was like, I think three, four weeks later, we moved from Jeddah to Sharjah where I learned English. That was a big cultural shock for me. I, that was the first, I, stu I had no, it wasn't a mixed class, for example, in me. It was like only, you know, boys. And I was there like, wow. And I, you see that and, 15 and a half, I think. Yeah, 15 years old. I, this is where I started to learn English. And I was very, very eager and hungry. And my my English teacher, Miss O'Connor, God bless her, the first line she told us, he's like, what is, what, she's like, what is language? What is English? She's like, if you want to go from point A to point B, what do you tell the teller? You can just say, A, B, me, go. Like that was the communication level. I loved her. And uh, I did so well that they sent me to a scholarship in, in England. And I went to... Uh, to study English. And I was the only Arab kid in that school. It was in England, in Yorkshire specifically. And I got the best student for a reason because I had I didn't have anyone to talk to Arabic. <laughs> so the, the, the teacher gave me the best student. I was like, there was Spanish people, there was, you know, Mexican, there was uh, um, a lot of people from different parts, but there was no Arab kids. So, That's amazing. Yeah, I got the best student simply because I didn't speak the Arabic language for like two weeks with anybody. You said um, coming to Sharjah from Jeddah in the, this would be like the early nineties, mm, I guess, yeah. was a culture shock. How was big it a time. culture shock for you? That, yeah, big time. I saw like, I, I saw, you know, sisters. I saw like, you know, and I saw like it's mixed and I saw different nationalities and it was just, I'm learning a new language. I got, my vibe was Arabic. I'm hundred percent thinking in Arabic. Then I got into the culture over here. I got into basketball and I got into music generally. Uh, but basketball, I used to watch basketball, still do, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning and listen to the commentators, even on the way to school, sometimes we watch games. Um, 
he passed the ball. What an incredible dunk by Shaquille O'Neal. You get the vibe. And I got into that, really. <laughs> so I'm a product of that. That's for sure. really cool. Um, so you went to Lebanon for university? I went to, uh, I studied in, in uh, last year of high school was in Shui Fat and then went to freshman. And this is where things, um, like I got accepted computer science. You see, I got so confused. I don't know anything about computer science, but I got accepted. And it was like, what? And then, you know, I wanted to do business and it, Bayah can't, it's lost in, in an incredible way at that point. And then it feels like, I, it feels my dad getting sick was God's way of just saying, you're not doing the right thing, man. Like, I don't know what's happening right there, but it's like, you have to fix a lot of things. And because when that happens, I moved to Jeddah and uh, back to Jeddah and start working. And then, you know, um, eventually down the line, uh, my father passed away and then I went back again. It was just great. It was really a lost time for me. So people, when they asked me that, it's really, I was lost. I was just wanted to make money to help my family. And I have no background. I'm not a genius in school. I'm, there's nothing. That's why I'm saying blogging and hip hop really saved my life. I got into it and now I'm making money because I got into it and I'm passionate about it. I'm nowhere close. Like guys, I'll tell you this. I'm the least talented person in this room. I can give you that as a fact. Fact. <laughs> what, um, can I ask what happened to your father? What, what was <clears throat> his illness? It was uh, it was a it was a like a, a brain stroke, um, kidney damage, kidney failure, um, yeah, many other things as well. So it, it like the the first time when I had to relocate, it was a it was a stroke. Alhamdulillah, he passed that. But then down the line, he, he managed uh, to get a, a kidney disease and a kidney failure, and he was on dialysis, um, which is uh, yeah, just it's very yeah. difficult on the family. It was, it was, but. <laughs> Yeah, it, it it it's one of those it's one of those where you just wish that you were you know that, that they're proud of you your parents are proud of you and that you were able to be there. But we had we used to have incredible discussions and conversations even towards the end, you know. So um, yeah, uh, rest in peace for sure. How did you make your first hundred uh, dirhams in life? Hey, what a question! Uh, I actually remember that. <laughs> it was, um, Officially or not officially? <laughs> I don't I <have> both. <laughs> no, because I used to do like really good chocolate chip cookies. And you would sell them in school? Sell them in the compound. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that was unofficially the first. No, that's 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 legit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it was it was interesting, you know. How but old were you? I think uh, that that was when um, I think that was around um, sixteen, maybe. That's unusual. Uh, very to, unusual, yeah. To, but it was very easy for me. Like, you know, it, it, I don't know. I really liked cookies growing up. Like, seriously loved cookies. Um, I love cookies now. Yeah. yeah. Mm, I, I can't eat that a lot right now. But <laughs> it, yeah, back then I was, oh, my middle name was cookies. It was crazy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that. But then I remember having the first job I did. And it was a sales representative at one of the big chains. Um, and... Uh, like a supermarket chain? No, it was like a, a fat, Debenhams. Oh, okay, okay. So okay. I used to work as a sales rep and um, a lot of stories happened there in Saudi Arabia. And I remember getting my first paycheck, which was about 3,500 riyals. Uh, I come to my dad, oh, father, look, look what I got. You know, it was just, I, yeah, just incredible to see that. And a lot of stories happened there as well, like in, 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 in that store in terms of like just funny and crazy cultural. Um, at one point, a lady was calling me Salis because I had sales representative. <laughs> it's like Salis come through. Like, Salis, my name, my family name is representative. <laughs> so really, it's a lot of that stories. Uh, <laughs> I, I got to say, like, I also worked in one of the fast food joint um, uh, restaurants. And it was big. Actually, it was McDonald's. Uh. But what happened was this. It was very interesting. Um, and I'll quickly, so I was hired. And I was hired to be, um, you know, working in, in the restaurant. And then one point, at one, it was my first day. I remember vividly. My first day I walked in, I'm walking in the restaurant and then there was nobody in the cashier and there was a customer. So I kind of took there and like, what's your order? And I started talking to them. And the manager saw, he's like, you're Saudi and you, you speak like English. Like, what are you doing in the restaurant? Come, come to, you should be the manager. Like, what? Like, it, I, I was promoted in the first hour from... From there because to being, of language. Because That's of amazing. language. 
That's amazing you know? that your father had that foresight. Because of inshallah. because of language, he's like Saudi and you speak English. Oh, let us go. I'm like, uh, but they interviewed me. They knew that as well. So you know, <laughs> weird things like that always happen with me. So yeah, um, that's very cool. Okay, um, so it, from what I've heard, uh, 2007 2008 was a pretty big turning point for you in terms of is that the first time that you ever heard an Arabic hip hop song? Facts. Okay, tell tell us that story. That that is that point. Two thousand. It was two thousand and seven, mid uh, mid two thousand and seven. Uh, just a year, uh, you know, two thousand eight actually. A year after I got married, um, just sitting there on the computer, and then I don't know how I bumped into. Seriously, it it happened when I bumped into an Iraqi um, uh, Canadian artist, Narsi, and then. It kind of spiraled. Wait, 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 hang on. Okay. So uh, up until this point, you're doing odd jobs wherever you can find them. Is Facts. that accurate? Okay. Yeah. And then how you're on the computer. Mm. This is 2007. How did you bump into Narcy? Interesting. I think it was on YouTube. It was on. It, it was mainly on YouTube. But to be honest, like the, the actual story um, is I had a friend of mine. His name is Walid. We call him Wido. Uh, Egy Egyptian uh, uh, living in Canada right now. And uh, he used to go back and forth a lot. At one point, he got a mixtape, and that mixtape had a lot of uh, a lot of independent artists. I think Narsi was one of the artists um, in that. And and the main thing was like, how come I never heard about these artists? How come we never play these artists on the radio? Which led me to kind of just kind of search, like you know, because music independent artists, and that's how I got into Narsi, Loki, Shadi Mansour, Omar Ofendim. These are the four names that shaped who Big Haas is. I always say this, 100%, these, because it was crazy. My mind, I didn't sleep that night. At one point, you know, my wife, just one year married, my wife was like, yo, yo, like, what, what? And I'm like, I got into it. It was a six hour research. And that's why what people don't understand is what they keep telling me, I'm loud and passionate because it shifted me. It changed me as a human in a matter of hours. So your friend Walid mm. gave you this mixtape. Yeah. And then you, you got home and you, Put it in the tape recorder. No, tape I didn't player. take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were listening in the car and okay. it kind of sparked the whole kind of, there was always a spark, right? So it sparked the whole thinking. Like, what, what is this on the radio? Why are we listening to this? Um, why are these guys not on the radio? Um, the subjects that these artists were talking what about, were, what political. Were they, what were they talking about? But, but, but at that point was very political. Um, and because I'm coming in from Saudi Arabia, there was none of that. There was none of the political talk. And so is yes, Arabic hip hop was political. Right now we're really diversified, but very political, social community issues that I never heard anyone sing about that in my in my generation. And to be hundred percent or not to sugarcoat it, I wasn't into that. Like I was just really being spoon fed what entertainment is giving to me. So if you want to sum up Hassan, you'll say, I don't like to be spoon fed entertainment or news. Go look for the news. That's the essence of what I do. You look for it because what, whatever we're being spoon fed is not right. Uh, and, 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 and that's, that's why I connect a lot with what you guys do. Cause you, you reflect that in your own way and your own narrative, um, as, as a culture right here. So yeah, it impacted me. And I say this not in a cheesy way. I, it, it changed my mind. I woke up the next day, my wife would testify like Hassan before that day, that night is different. He's a, a different human being. Okay, I want to um, un unpack that uh, trigger moment a little bit more. So, so you you were listening to the tape in the car, yes, and you put it in, and like, who who was in the car with you? Your wife? Uh, me, me, no, me and Walid. You and Walid. So, yeah, so he, went. so he was like, I need, I need you to listen to this. Yeah, he was like, just he always because his family used to go to Canada a lot, so he used to bring a lot of, um, you know, tapes and music coming out, and it was just not about a specific artist. It was just more about. The, the the vibe and different artists. Um, and it was like an actual cassette. Mixtape, uh, like, yeah, a cassette tape, yeah, 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 100%. And it was just, that sparked the idea about, we're not, like, this is not, I don't know what I'm listening to. <laughs> uh, we need to do something about this. So that night I went and I, and YouTube was like, what, a year and a half old maybe or something like that. So I was shocked. It, really that, what did you Google? I mean, what did it, you It was more search? like about independent artists. I got into rappers who, who, who sing in Arabic. It, even the terminologies was like, I didn't know, like, <laughs> you know, so 
uh, got into the narcissist back then. It's like, what he's doing? Like he had a record and it was very political. And then Shadi Mansour, um, uh, with, with incredible records about Palestine, Loki, who is this British Iraqi uh, MC activist, very changed who I am as a person with his lyrics. I'm like, oh my God, like that guy. And then Omar Ofendim with the poetry, this guy translates poetry from Nizar Qabbani, Qabbani from Arabic to English as a bridge. You see all these terminologies. I didn't have that before. I'm like, what is bridge? What are you talking about? That all was instilled in that six, seven hour night. And that's why I think for me, it's more about the, the early hours of the morning is very, very important to me because I think at that, it was at that time that I was changed as a human. Um, and when I say changed, I mean, like a lot of people are like, what do you mean? Like, I, I, truly. So we had only one radio station in Saudi, just to put it in perspective. And that radio station played Arabic pop song that had the radio host of that, um, the, all the radio hosts back then were Lebanese and we we're in Saudi Arabia. I'm like, why is she Lebanese? And the population is Saudi. That doesn't make sense. It loves a lot of forward, fast forward to that. Th th that changed, that culture changed. They started bringing Saudi radio hosts, someone like that sound my cousin, my friend. And, and, and that connected more. Um, so there was no connection at all. So when I heard that, I was like, I got to do something about it. And I think three, four days later, I launched Revolt blog. And I don't know, maybe later I'll show you the first post. It's ugly. I would love to see the first post. It's fam, it's bad. It was like a fist, a fist, and it was radio and a speaker and a headphone. Don't let the radio tell you what to listen to. <laughs> yes, that <laughs> you know, it really was that. And I'm typing with anger, capital letters, and like, and I will. Uh, 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 did you know that the music industry, because um, you know you do research, and, and they only release two percent or five percent of the music that is actually being released there. Did you know that they play the same ten songs in rotation on radio? Let's change that. We're revolt. It was like that. That was the <laughs> that was the communication. That's epic. Um, so yeah, and I started this online radio that only my wife and a couple of friends used to listen to. Three people. On a given night, they used to listen to me. Like hosted on SoundCloud? Host. It was, I forgot even what was it called. No, it was an online radio. It was a, it was a, a, a platform and I used to go live there and, and people just to click that link and then go there and really weird. I'm telling you, mad. Um, it's not mad. It's awesome. No, think about it. And then I got, at one point I connected with somebody that the pirate radio in the, in the UK and they're like, where are you? Like, I'm in the middle of the sea right now. Whoa, what, what do you mean? Like in the middle of, you know, like all these things. So- Actually, uh, um, the story of revolt as a name is is, is it's a combination of two names: uh, revolution, because I wanted to revolt against the mass media and the mainstream media and what they do, and voltage, because I loved radio and I wanted to do our own radio station one day. Hence, it's re dash volt. And I came up with it before Diddy. I just want to say that. <laughs> I just want to say that because Diddy came up with it that's, later. That's important. That's important. very important to establish that. You know, Diddy. I'm not people who talk to your people, my brother. No, I'm just saying it's uh, it's incredible. So the re dash vault is this is where it actually came, and it's been a house. Uh, it's been a name that I really connected with, and I've always stuck with it since 2007 because that's the essence of it. And I remember um, a, a lot of people were like, "Revolt in Saudi Arabia," and like, "You're not worried," and. Like, no, I'm not doing anything against like, my culture or religion or like the, it's more about the statement of it. But that was some of the comments I got, you know, um, early on. Um, this first mixtape from your friends with Yid, had you listened to hip hop or rap before? Mm. Uh, defi when you define hip hop, I would say no. And and this will come as a shock for many people. How do you go like 20 years without hearing a hip hop yeah. song? Uh, the, I used to listen to Nas and Biggie throughout, but- uh. And this will come as a shock for many people. And I um, I got into hip hop because of Arabic hip hop. Not because of Nas no, and- No, and And that's why I say it, I liked these guys, but I never really connected with, 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 with them. That's me. For a lot of people, it would be like, I got into it through bad, you know, Nas, Biggie, whatever, Tupac. And that's cool. Don't get me wrong. Like every person has a story. For me to be 100% frank with you, that was it. I used to listen to, especially Biggie. Like Biggie for me was, I, I love Biggie. I love his vibe. Nas, like that was connected to it at a certain point. But I really got immersed to hip hop as a culture because I started listening to these four rappers, uh, Arab, uh, in the diaspora. I was like, I love hip hop. 
I want to get into hip hop. What 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 was it about Arabic hip hop in particular? The connection, that, like, like the the you're talking about it. Uh, you they mainly the work rap in English as well, but it was so Arab. If you mm. get if you know what I mean, terminologies was was a little bit of Arabic here. The vibe was 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 Arabic. What they were was Arabic. Um, the culture was there, so that I connected with that, and from that I started researching about and studying hip hop. Yanni, it was something like, I see myself in what they're saying kind of thing, like that kind of identification. Oh, big time. Yes, 100%. I, I definitely saw myself, I connected. I, I thought that this is what people need to listen to. Uh, this was a big, big thing uh, for me, like, because I used to come in, uh, come as, uh, you're forcing us to listen. I'm like, you got to listen. You have to listen to this. You got to elevate your mind. Like this was the energy back then uh, for me. It was just because it impacted me. And I'm thinking it can definitely impact um, other people too. So I got into that and that led me to study hip hop as a culture and still continue to study this incredible culture uh, that started in the early 70s. And they're like, where in New York and this, you know, Sedwick Avenue there. Oh, wow. Who's cool? Herc, who's, it's just really remarkable what we don't know. And people that claim to be hip hop without me naming any names, there was one big Arab rapper who's really big in the Arab region. And I, when I launched the radio show, I actually interviewed DJ Cool Herc and I'm the only one who's in the Arab region who interviewed the founder of hip hop. DJ Cool Herc is the father of hip hop. So I told him, I'm, he's like, who's that? I'm like, how do you call yourself a rapper or a hip hop enthusiast? And you haven't studied, you know, that culture, at least from the beginning, what is the elements of hip hop, the elements of it? What, where, where did it come from? Why did it come? It's not only the booty shaking and the, you know, gang signs and all that. Like, so see, I got into it early on. And then when I connected with these rappers, to be honest, they all showed me love, so much love. It was my space, like a, a message on my space or something like that. And it was, they all showed like, what? We have a, a blogger like out in the, in the Arab region who's, who's talking about us. Like, seriously, it was like, it was that, it was, yeah. What was the scene like? So we're talking late 2000s. For, for me personally, I think I was introduced to Arabic hip hop and rap through Amr Fandom oh. after the revolution in Egypt because of the song that he January did. January 25th. Yeah, oh, January 25th. I had that on repeat actually. And that was the first time I was like, oh yo, we, we can sing like this. And then uh, more recently with Mahar Ganat in Egypt. Of course. But I have no idea what the scene was like in the late mm. 2000s. What, who, who, who was in it? Yeah. What was it like? What were they singing about? Yeah. It's incredible you say that. It's, uh, so Arabic rap started off as really put in that political box. I remember the first time I spoke to Ramallah Underground, who are a group from Palestine who had uh, Asifa, Stormtrap back then, and Muqata, incredible producers and rappers. And I remember the first time talking to them. And uh, again, this kid from Jeddah is talking to, uh, you know, rappers in Palestine. They were like, Hassan, uh, there's a tank outside my door. What do you want me to write about? Seriously, that, that was a really cultural thing for me. Because again, back then, in the news, they didn't talk about that. Mm. especially like, you know, Saudi news. And you see like the whole thing. So of course, like uh, I'm an internet, you know, um, cultural kid, internet really helped a lot. And, but back then there was none of that back then on TV. So I didn't, I wasn't aware. So t it was very political, politically charged coming in from, especially the Philistine, Lebanon. Um, uh, you know, for example, the scene where I was f from in Saudi, there was a couple of rappers, but it started off on the wrong foot with a lot of disses and beefs. What people have to understand is- Disses this, and what? Disses and beefs. So a beefs. diss, okay. beefs is like a, you know- Te be Teach me these things. Oh yeah. A, a beef is like a, you're, you're like kind of battling, but like it's a lot of, you know, swear words and just like kind of coming at it. What people have to understand though, and, and I, I, I love the fact that I'm, I'm on here saying that you, you, we cannot say, oh, who's the best rapper in the Arab region? Or like, because it's the Arab region is so diverse. So that the story of Arabic rap, right? Um, obviously hip hop started in New York and then obviously- Not uh, obviously, teach us the history of hip hop, please. No, no, I mean, oh my God, I, I'd love, <laughs> like, I'd love, this is actually kind of my dream to be there. And I don't think I'm even um, um, eligible to talk about that, but I'll talk about what I know and the fact. So hip hop migrated from obviously America and spread in Europe, specifically in France, let's say, right? France, which is an amazing, uh, they have incredible rappers in France. Now, Arabic rap started coming because the brothers and sisters from North Africa started traveling obviously to Europe and of course France. So people from Tunisia, 
Morocco, Libya, Algeria, start traveling. And they started rapping and they started to get to know what hip hop is, start rapping in French. But then they like, why are we rapping in French, man? We have, we have our own lingo. That's how it started, right? And Rai played so a cool. big role in North Africa that connected Rai music and hip hop music together. What's Rai? Rai music. Uh, the, the, what Shab Khaled does, for example. Uh, 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 okay, so that okay. that that type of music, which was very very authentic to 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 obviously the North Africa, connected a lot with rap and hip hop. So a lot of the big stars used to kind of connect together and do songs together with rap music and hip hop and rap. So that's how obviously Arabic rap started um, from from there, and then obviously it started migrating to the Levant, um, you know, Bilad Sham, um, and then from there it started going to the GCC. You see how you see how mm-hmm. going to uh, and then even after that going to uh, you know countries like Sudan and Egypt and then going to the diaspora. You see how just in like a matter of less than a minute, it's so hard to pinpoint. At one point, and I know you would agree with that. A lot of people would agree with that. Some of the Moroccan rappers you don't even understand what they're saying. Mm-hmm. They're Arabs, but they don't understand the dialect. So. So how do you, what's the best Arab rapper mean? What does that mean? Where, which country, which area? Because everyone is talking about it from a different, and that's why when they tell you right now, where's Arabic rap? North Africa, Morocco, and Algeria is mad in terms of numbers, in terms of streaming, in terms of the culture, it plays on the radio. People are accustomed to it, Um, but it's not, it's not the same in the GCC. And that's why I say it got on the GCC on the wrong foot. Now, this is where I'm at (laughs) in Saudi Arabia. Uh, a lot of this is a lot of West Coast, East Coast. I'm like, bro, we don't have West Coast and East Coast right here. What do you, what? In Saudi? Yeah, like, what do you mean West Side and East? Because obviously Tupac and Biggie. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, bro? Like, Mafi, West Side and East Side. Shut up, yeah. <laughs> Facts. And I was like, you know, so I was like, a lot of that, me talking about it. And because I studied a little bit of that culture. So no, but acts get instruments get a vibe tell your own story uh d- d- tell your own struggle um you see why this is why this is interesting because down the line again i had that conversation and i interviewed ll cool j on the radio which was massive for me that's so cool massive and the the first man the first kind of three minutes he said i'm very honored to be here but i want to say thank you to you like he's thanking me ll cool j one of the most iconic hip-hop artist in the world is thanking me for allowing him to get into our culture. And at the end, he's like, don't rap in English, rap in Arabic, rap in your own. You have a beautiful culture. Stop copying the West. And you see all these things kind of instilled what I was fighting for, which is the whole thing about, you know, the, the, the Western and uh, a lot of copy paste there was, especially in, in the, in the GCC. And then the, this is in the beefs that the bad lingo came and it started bringing bad energy to rap. Like people used to sit in front of supermarkets in Saudi and they used to send Bluetooth songs to each other. Ta, 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 ee, 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 swear this, your mom, this. I'm like, oh man, this is. So my generation who are Saudis grew up and like thinking rap is for like, it's for people who Good put limbs. their pants down mm. and you know, this is your mom, this is your dad, swear words. It's not, not, this is not a good thing for our culture. This is not right. This is a, you know, and it was very, it's, it's, it's a struggle. Has the scene evolved oh, in the yeah. GCC? Oh yeah. What are now, people rapping about now? Uh, so before that, there was the, so 2000 and obviously at eight, I did the blog and then I wanted to change that narrative. And I was like, three, four people is not going to do it. Huh? It's like, man, like people need to listen to you, you know? So I pitched on- oh, uh, From your online radio station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, maximum I think I had was the 30 people at one point. I was like, nah, I need to reach more. So I pitched a- uh, how, Sorry, how yeah. often did you do the online radio every week. station? Every week. Yeah, yeah, every week. Every Every week. Every, it was Sunday? A, it was a- Every Thursday, because Thursday back then was a day off, uh, you know. Um, so Thursday, Thursday night, I go on. <laughs> My wife would tune in from the living room <laughs> and I'm in the bedroom. Let's go, everyone. I'll play music. And it's just really, uh, yeah, massive. Um, I love that. Did you do like a, like a, like a blanket over your head kind of thing? Like, like we do in the early no, days for no, podcasting? No, no, no. See, I, I see that people do that now. No, no, no. It was okay. just, yeah, just straight a up. A mic like, in the living room. Okay, okay. That's cool. And <laughs> and people, I used to, to be honest, it, it was more music than me talking. You know, it was more like a lot of music. I used to play a lot of, and maybe every now and then I'd say, I, I'd and say how, a how did you words. find the music? It, it was, you know, mainly on, 
uh, I think, was it was it Napster back then? Oh, yeah. Napster. Napster, yeah. I think. It's download a lot of music there. Uh, um, you know, the software that I used, I'm trying to remember, used to play music from the YouTube, whatever song is also played there. Um, yeah. And so, sometimes artists would send me a song when I reach out to, I'm playing your song on Saudi Arabia on the wavelength, uh, on, on the internet. He's like, what? Well, okay, take it, whatever, you know. It was really, people didn't really believe. Um, what did you call your online station? Revolt. Revolt. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Revolt Radio. Okay. Like that, that, that was it, you know, and so, started doing interviews with people on uh, Skype um, and then recording that and putting it on. And there was a, there was a platform called DiffShare back then. Like now it's closed and I used to upload all the interviews that I've done back then are gone now because DiffShare closed. Oh. I know. I, I used to have used another one. But see, again, I've done a lot of interviews, but they're all gone because the diff share company closed. <laughs> I hope one day they'll come back. <laughs> like all the thing with services, but yeah. Um, so you're doing this every Thursday night, and this is a passion project on the side. Meanwhile, how are you supporting your family? Working, like so. so sales. I used to. Uh, I worked in this company that sells. Uh, you know, sometimes these TV screens that you put on the shelves in the supermarket. So I used to sell that. That was a revolution back then. That was something really new to put a screen on the shelf. Like if you're working in the pasta shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was also the voiceover in the supermarket. Go you have buy, a great, you get have a one great buy. voice. Yeah, but back then my my friends would say like, bro, you're annoying us right now. Like your, your voice is everywhere. Like you're, you're here. And Wait, there. dude, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go <laughs> buy okay. what? Do it again. So, so it's basically... Um, it, it, it's these screens that you put on the shelves. And I used to be the voiceover of the screen and of the supermarket as well. And people used to get annoyed sometimes, like, you know, we go in there, your voice is everywhere. And, I, you know, and this is how we used to make money from obviously the advertising on. So I, my job is to go to, um, and this is what uh, my introduction to also advertising agencies, um, you know, the BBDOs, the Lee Burnett's and so on and so on. And it was, I got into it that way. And, yeah, crazy. I used to sell ads, just ads. And how long were you doing the Revolt online station, online radio station before you were like, I need to reach more people than the 30, the 30 loyal fan base that I yeah. have? No, that, that, that always continued until <laughs> it continued for a while. I continued for like a year and a half. I always, I always did that regardless of what, but so it was, I would say from 2008 till mid of 2009, or even 2010, I did it for quite some time. But then this is where I wanted to do something different. And I, and uh, like I said, at one point, we had only that one radio station. In 2011. In Saudi. In Saudi. Two stations opened. New, Shababi, young, energetic, Saudi radio hosts, Saudi lingo on the FM. Those were really imp was impacting a lot the scene. And I hit up one of them, Mix FM. And man, oh man, it was a struggle. It was, hip hop was a struggle just to even get a meeting. They're like, hip hop, Saudi? No, automatically. Hip hop, Saudi? No. Hip hop, Saudi? No. I swear like 15 times. I remember the manager was Egyptian. And the producer and the person who started the radio station and kind of programmed it together is Palestinian. I had to do something. A lot of talks with my wife, a lot of... I'm so down, I need to have that show on the FM. It's happening. It stayed like for at least six months. I'm banging on the door every other week. Every other week, I'm banging on the door. Like, da, da, da. The last few months, uh, the last month. Do you mean actually banging on the door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. I was there in the studio. And they're like, no, no, we're not doing that. It's not right. So the evolution of Hassan as a thinker, as what people call now, like obviously entrepreneur business, I was like, I need to approach it differently. This is not working. Like whatever it is, they're not listening. So I was like, okay. I went there and I had like slides uh, of presentations very weirdly done. Again, I'm the least creative person you'll ever meet, seriously, but it's there. It but I love job. that you have a PowerPoint ready. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was there. Like, you know, just, so I was like, it was two slides. <laughs> One slide that says, this will get you new audience, people that will do not even tune in on the radio. They don't even know what radio is maybe, like this out, like they don't know. And I will get you those. Two, you'll, the, 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 the word I used was pioneer and visionary. And I attached to that, our model fandom record, uh, Finjan, who is uh, actually, you know, uh, um, translating the poetry of Nizar Qabbani from, from Arabic to English. And there's a little bit of Arabic into it and stuff. Like that. And that's what I pitched. And when they heard the beat, they heard the vibe, 
they're like, hmm. How did, how did you get them to listen? Yeah, it was it was on YouTube. Uh. And it was they 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 heard it. And I was like, I got them a lot of samples, a lot of Arab samples, Um Kulthum, Abdul Halim with the vibe of hip hop. I told them the name of the show, which is Lesh Hip Hop. And they're like, Lesh. I'm like, Hagul like Lesh. You have to you have to tune in. I'll tell you why. And I've been doing that for 11 years. You know, the show still continues till now. And I'm so proud of that. Every single week, even though I'm in the UE right now, I send my show every week to the station. Oh my God. Yeah, 11 years and celebrating. I'm very proud of that. That is definitely a big milestone for me in terms of, uh, the, the, the station has been very uh, loving. And although I'm in a different country and it's a recorded show, but people are still tuning in. It's still the only hip hop radio show in Saudi Arabia after all these years. Imagine. What was the conversation? Um, so they were like, okay, these beats are cool. We'll give you a show. Mm. And then, oh, man. and w- w- what what was going through your mind when they said, we'll do it together and this is what it'll look like? I went insane. I, I think I, I teared a lot. I was like going, because it took a period of six months. And at that one point, I think, halas, you know, you know that image they show you always where you have to dig, dig, dig. And there's one more dig until you reach that light. I'm like, I'm like definitely there. I'm, I'm in there, I was going to give up. Like, it's not going to work. Six months, it's not going to work. And I didn't have any radio background. Any back then, like the radio background that I have is in my room. I don't know how to use the mixer. I didn't know how to use anything. But what's interesting, because there are new radio stations and they were launching. So I launched with them. Like it was mid-2011. This is where it launched uh, the station. And look, 2011 till now, that's 11 years plus, still with them. That well, That's one of the very few shows that's in the station that's still there from the beginning. That's awesome. Um, that means something, right? Like, so uh, impacted, played music, played Saudi rap, uh, hosted uh, breakers, graffiti artists, rappers, a couple of DJs, um, hosted DJ Cool Herc, Public Enemy, LL Cool J, you know, all these. And then Omar Offendim, Narsi, Shadia Mansour, <laughs> Loki. I had them on the show. The people who started it all. The off. first year, yeah. But that was very tricky, to be honest, because these guys are very political. How to get them on the radio. So... Um, maybe I'll tell you a funny story later on if we have time. What I did on the radio was like, why, why tell can it? I say it now? Yeah. So there's this, um, story that I've done, um, thing that I've done on the air and for a lot of radio guys, it's a no, no, but I don't know how I did it. And I didn't get away with it, but I'll tell you the story that shows you my mind. So obviously, um, Saudi, um, not only Saudi, radio generally, you can't play very heavy music in that perspective. Saudi, Zid al Ziada, you know, it's extra. <laughs> a record, Shadia Mansour, is called Al Kufiya Arabiya. <laughs> Kufiya is Arab and will remain Arab. Oh man. I gotta play this on the radio. Um, so back then, because it's hip hop, they used to monitor the songs I play, meaning I have to send my list of songs to the radio for them to see every single lyric. Uh, and a lot of things happened there in terms of education as well for me in terms of like telling them about things. But anyway, like 12, 13 songs I used to send and then they send the approval and then we move forward. Like these lyrics are, are exactly. good. Yeah. No, but but to be honest, all, safe. The, 100%, all the lyrics that I've done is clean. There, there's not a, none of that. So I used to clean using audacity, to be honest. And it used to be like clinic like that because none of the artists had clean version back then. So I used to do that work. Um, 12, 13 songs I sent, they give me the approval. They give me the feedback. We go forward. At that point, when I sent Shadia, they rejected that record. And I knew that was coming. Nope. Out. Why? Why did they reject it? It is Al Kufiya Arabiya. It's a very, very powerful record towards, you know, Palestine, what it does it represent. Uh, it had M1 from Dead Prez on it. You know, the guys who sings uh, hip, uh, um, hip, um, uh, hip hop is dead. Like M1 is a legend in the game. So he was featured and the video was shot in Palestine. Shadia is, Shadia Mansour is the first lady of Arabic rap. Um, and and she just rocks it. She wears always the Palestinian top. She rocks, she has a cause, which is Palestine. Um, that's what she sings about and raps about. Um, so that record came in as, and talk about Kufiya. What is the what is the symbol that is the Kufiya? Very strong, very strong. So they banned it on the grounds that it was too political. Exactly. Mm. So they removed it. I'm like, okay, I still had the show. Um, so I, I <laughs> man, when I got that e- email, I was like, hmm, I'm, I want to play that record. I'm like, okay. So, man, this is going to be sounding crazy. But I mean, if they're listening, I mean, that's 11 years later now. You can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. 
So I have the file. What I did is this. I renamed the file to Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Seriously, it was a risk. So I did that and I sent it. So it, it was like, oh, there's this song I want to add because I want to talk about it. You know, like has nothing with hip hop, but I want to talk about it, right? Like this was the angle. I swear to God, guys in Hibba, they didn't even listen to it. It got on the system. But the file is Shadi Mansoor, bro. Like, so I got on the radio. My show was at 9 p.m. I got on the radio. It's there. I heard it. I'm like, that's the first song I'm playing. Let, let's go. I played that. I swear to God, 30 seconds later after I played it, the, the manager storming in, in the radio, like, bah, remove this song right now. Like, I, 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 what? What? what, what? I played like 30, uh, 70% of it. Mm. I got in trouble. I got in trouble, meaning I think I got like deducted two weeks or something like that. I was off for two weeks. But then to be honest, if you're asking if it's worth it, my, my heart is jumping right now because of the adrenaline. And it was like, yes, it's definitely worth it. It's, uh, it was, it's a no-no for many things, right, on radio. But look, to be honest with you, why didn't the guy just click play? Right to hear if it's a Britney Spears record. That's why Britney Spears is so safe for everybody. You know, like, why? What's that record? What's, what did you do? Oops, I did it again. Because they used to play that record maybe on the radio. I don't, I don't know. See, that's another thing. My show was once a week and it's still once a week. So six days, 24 hours a, a day, they play the Arabic pop music, the same thing. One minute? Oh, okay, okay. They, they play the same music. And then Le Shepha comes in and just goes south. Arabic rap, samples, beats, and it was different. It was a, a different kind of show. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened with that. But just looking back at it, it was just that revolt mentality, you know, um, in terms of just not taking no for an answer. Uh, so Leish Hip Hop launches in 2011. What is the audience reception in Saudi Arabia for a rap and hip hop radio station? You ready for this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first day, I'm very nervous, very excited. Even uh, one of the publications in, in Saudi, in Jeddah, posted Saudi, uh, a hip hop radio show in Saudi. Everyone was so excited and big deal. Thursday, 9 to 10 p.m. And oh man, let's go. Very nervous. I'm working the deck, the, the, the desks and stuff like that. Um, so I launched the show and I'm speaking in, in Arabic and English, to be honest. It was like, Salam alaikum, everybody. Uh, Welcome to uh, Le Hip Hop, the program the first and the only in Saudi Arabia that is about the culture and hip hop, the 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 show that focuses on hip hop as a culture and promotes also local and regional talents. And the first and only. Yes, and I I wanted to be like that because initially I wanted to inspire other people to also have a radio show. Sadly, that that didn't happen. But we'll talk about that. But so I did that. I played my first record. My first record was called Jeddah Love by a group called Jeddah Fam. And it was from Jeddah. They were not, they couldn't believe it. No one played this music on the radio. I played that record because I'm from Jeddah and the record is amazing. It's a group, it's a hip hop slash R&B group in, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um, I played that record. So I finished that record and then there's a screen next to my, so that you see the messages. First message I get, the first message that pops up, it's a kafir. Of course. You're an infidel. I'm like, wow. I had to play two other songs because I really needed a moment. I'm like sitting like there. And because it's a Thursday and it's a day off, there was nobody in the station. There was only the sound engineer to make sure everything is okay. To be honest with you, just revisiting that, I got scared. I got really scared. I was like, no, 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 this is not, they're not ready. Like it's not, it's not going to be good at all. But then I started thinking about it because I had like two songs. I put like six minutes and I'm like, I'm not doing anything against my culture or religion or country or I'm not doing anything wrong. But let me, I saw two ways, just leave or let's continue. And it's going to be really cool. I have, I prepared the show and I actually, back then I used to write the show because I was nervous. So I'm like writing everything I'm saying, like, because I was really nervous. I wanted to come out perfect. Right now, I don't even know what a paper is, but it's done. But um, th th back then, so I came back, came back strong. I was like, I'm, 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 let's go. Uh, I had a conversation, conversation with my wife as well. I called her and she instilled 
do whatever you feel like, but I'll tell you, like, go, you're not, like, it's, you're good. It's just, I didn't, I didn't see that resistance, Sarah. Just me saying that, it gives me uh, anxiety and also, in a way, goosebumps because that moment was like, what if I said no? What if I quit? Like, seriously, what if I quit? What would happen to, what, where will I be? Would I go back to sales rep? Would I go back to, because I think it would have destroyed me. Seriously, that comment. And I'm like, bam, start talking hip hop as a culture. Where did it start from? What's the element of hip hop? Rap, what does rap stand for? The rhythm and poetry. Share iqa. you see the momentum. And I'm like, it's not only rap, you guys, it's DJs. That's where it started. DJs used to break the record. This is where they launched the record. DJs were imported, blah, blah, blah. Rap, this is, yeah, MC. You know, what is the MC? Master of Ceremony. An MC, what did they do? Um, breakers, or, or what they call break dancing, but breakers, what did they do? It's the expression of hip hop through dance. Great. Uh, graffiti, when you see that, it's not uh, it's not uh, things that to destroy but acts it's a contrary graffiti is a way it's a be beautiful visual way to express knowledge the fifth element of hip-hop that people don't talk about to elevate your mind i went on a roll so like me, you, your program was educational me ranting yes beginning and still beginning was like a lot of, every single week i say this because every single week there's people new listening and and that's why i say it's more like a hip-hop culture what did it do why did it hip-hop do this to you man what is it about rap uh that, that changed you like that why are you so loud and passionate bro like calm down right i'm not calm the, all these questions i've addressed and of course playing music that don't get played on anywhere um and then obviously the internet helped twitter helped a lot with me reaching out to people um chuck d public enemy fight the power on the radio in saudi that's crazy. Like that, that, that's a song that, you know, um, just massive. And then, uh, DJ cool Herc, when I interviewed, I hit up his sister three months later, she replied with an email and like, he's interested to do it. No one from the Arab region interviewed DJ cool Herc till now. People don't know him. He's the guy who created hip hop culture as a, he's the father of hip hop. How come no one knows? Because people don't care about the culture and the elements of it. A great interview with a guy that is like, and he was just getting honored. And um, yeah, very shocking. He's like, I remember talking to him and he's like, where are you calling me from? I said, Saudi Arabia. And he said, hip hop reached that far. It's there. Like it's there in audio. What a guy. Like the guy is 70 plus, right? When he said that, I really got emotion. It was like a, a 10 minute interview, you know, and very, very, so stuff like that, interviewing local artists, uh, talking to them, having a radio show, like except there's a lot of shows in the US, whether it's you're looking at Hot 97 and there's the Breakfast Club show, right? There's a lot of shows that they talk discussions and uncomfortable discussion, but that's the radio in the US. I tried to do that in Saudi, it was hard, but most of the rappers that you see in Saudi right now had their first interview with me back then 11 years ago and they're young starting to and now like you know just beautiful to see that grow um beautiful to see the evolution grow um if uh okay so <clears throat> if you were talking to uh, somebody who didn't understand rap and hip-hop somebody who is a skeptic yeah. how would you explain what rap is and what hip-hop is to them for a lot of people, they know like hip hop was created to actually destroy the violence between gangs. Um, and and, and hip hop was created to KRS-One, who's one of the biggest, you know, hip hop artists and cultural icons when it comes to that. Hip hop is about peace, love, unity, and having fun. You see all these things, peace, unity, love, and having fun. So it was a lot of that. Now you go like, yeah, but look what they're talking about, gun violence, this and that, sexualizing things. And, but that's where hip hop kind of, like the diversity of hip hop, you know, anyway. So um, one of my favorite artists, his name is Brother Ali, uh, incredible guy. Um, he's an American rapper, a Muslim. He says something very interesting. He's like, imagine there's a meal, right? And you have a meal in front of you. The meal has a, has a what's the first meal called? Like a, appetizer. appetizer. And then there's the main course, right? And then there's the dessert. Well, for a lot of period of time, especially now, all you hear is the dessert. Now, is dessert nice? Dessert tastes really good, but is it healthy? Not all the time. You need the main course. That's what hip hop back in the 80s and 90s used to represent. You, you had your you had your tribe called Quest. You had your public enemy. You had your, you know, you had the big mix of both. It was something that fed the soul. Yeah. So you had, you had that. Now for a, the longest period of time, you had only the, the, the dessert or the appetizer. There was no context. 
Um, so that's what I used to say that a lot on the radio. And because it was a weekly show and people used to forget a lot, there's a lot of repetition when it comes to that uh, and a lot of uh, just saying. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm thinking about a couple of stories. One story I'd love to share with you. Um, Please. So there was a, a, a year after, uh, a year and a half after the show. Launched. I, yeah. Um, so I... Um, the the show I used to interview a lot of not only rappers but breakers graffiti artists which was very new and unique people didn't really focus about the other three elements like the DJing the graffiti and the, and the breaker they used to focus only on the rap rapper and I used to interview even producers and stuff like that so I had this interview with a graffiti group called Dodd who are really big right now I'm very proud of them it's called Dodd which is the letter in Arabic Dodd um, and I interviewed them and they're incredible. These guys used to sell graffiti cans from their car tank just because it was illegal. And then obviously now they launched Saudi's first graffiti store. That's cool. Massive. Anyway, I did an interview with them. And then there was this kid out in Medina who loves graffiti, but he keeps messaging me and saying, Hassan uh, or Big Haas, my fa- it was on Twitter, a DM. And uh, he's like, my father is against me doing graffiti. I'm like, hmm. can you ask him? If he can tune in just for the next two, three weeks, I'm going to focus more on graffiti. Just talk more about graffiti and hip hop as a culture. And he's like, okay, I'll try. And um, four weeks later, I get a call because this this gent, this boy ha- got my number, I think from the Dodd guys or something like that. Got a call and uh, the call was like, Salam alaikum, big ass. I'm like, oh, ass, no, no. I, um, don't, yeah, mm, okay, great. No, oh, he big ass, ass is different. <laughs> Okay, Hassan, Hassan, Kif, and I and I heard he's an old man. Like Kif, how can I help you? Um, Kif, I did a ammi. I remember. He's like, um, I've been listening to your show for the past two weeks. My son is this and that. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Um, and I just want to say that I'm standing right now outside my door, and I bought my son a wall, and he's gonna practice on it because of you. He's gonna practice graffiti on this wall. On him. That's incredible. I'm like, when I, when I heard that, I got really emotional. I was like, that's one person I impacted. I remember telling my wife as well. She's like, if you impacted that person, imagine what, because not a lot of people are going to call you and tell you you impacted them. That really was a big validation moment for me. I was like, man, I'm doing something, man. Like, I got to continue. I got to continue. Because to be honest, it got really tough because it's like every week and the listenership was not really booming a lot. And the radio was like, we need to increase the listenership. And it was like, no, no one wants to listen to hip hop and I'm going against the current. And there's a lot of these things, you know? Um, so yeah, that was a big moment. So these kinds of stories kept you going. Oh yeah. Big time. There was another story as well that, that re- revolutionized me. <laughs> Tell us. That story helped, um, saved me from quitting. So that was in 2000, I want to say 15. So about four uh, years into this. Yeah, I want to say 15. I'm on, the, I'm on Twitter. I saw someone randomly on Twitter say, Chuck D is coming to the American University of Beirut uh, to give a talk. I'm like, Chuck D is coming to Beirut? What? Why? And at that point, I, I follow Chuck D and he follows me on Twitter. We used to have a connection. We, um, I wanted to do something for his online radio in the States and stuff like that. If you don't know Chuck D, like he's one of the most incredible icons in hip hop, like, you know, fight the power. Public Enemy is incredible. He's, um, so I'm like, I found it about it two days before it happened. I DM'd him. I was like, I'm going to trap, I'm traveling from um, Jeddah to Beirut just to meet you, sir. He's like, let's go. I'm like, oh my God. I'm on the phone trying to find a plane ticket just to go. And, uh, you know, Jeddah to Beirut. I'm like, oh my, I'm traveling with day, very excited. I land in Beirut. Uh, he's there. And of course, not strange on someone like Chuck D, he's sitting with local rappers and producers, which is something that a lot of media from our generation don't do, right? They idealize the West a lot and they idealize the bigger artists. He's sitting on a table in a coffee shop. And um, man, I can't believe this is crazy. So all these rappers that I know, and some of them I met for the first time, obviously, and uh, were producers. So I walked in the coffee shop and Chuck D with his deep voice, Big Haas and everyone on the ra- on the table was like, how the hell does Chuck D know ba- what is going on? Seriously, so that was, I saw the reaction. So we stood, we stood, we embraced. And what I'm about to say saved me. Seriously, very simple, but saved me. So he's like, we hugged. And he, and he says this, 
So on Twitter, just to give a context, on Twitter, I used to rant a lot about the show. No one is listening to the show. What is this? This is really terrible. I'm like, I'm fighting the current, all that stuff. Never got any interaction from Chuck D at all, not even a like or whatever. He embraced me heavy. He like whispered in my ears, like, I see you. I see the struggle. Keep fighting. I'm like, how? What? Seriously right now? I stayed. I remember my friend, um, shout out to Chino out of Lebanon. Uh, he's a Syrian Filipino MC, incredible guy based in Lebanon. He's like, the whole time you're not there, bro. Like you're sitting at the table, you're not there. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about that. I'm sitting next to Chuck D who acknowledged me and said, keep fighting. This is the guy who said, fight the power, fight the power that may be in America. He's telling me as a radio host, a, a, a Jadawi, a, a, a soul that nowhere close to his level of genius and creativity and, and anger and revolt, telling me, keep fighting. I'm like, oh my God. I, I came back a changed man. Very revolutionary, very let's go. Even the people in the station is like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know, let's go. Like, I'm just very excited. So these are like, you know, these stories really shape you and 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 they impact you in a crazy way, you know, just, um, just looking back at it right now. And thank you so much for giving me even the platform to even talk about it. It feels like a, this is a therapy session. So <laughs> wow, it's <laughs> massive. Well, yes, bless you. <laughs> thank you. That's incredible. At, at what point, does um, does music become a career for you? Was it in 2011? As soon as the radio station, that was like, I'm 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 dedicated to this and for the rest of my life. I would say yeah. I mean, technically, this is where I started getting paid as well uh, from something that I do. Uh, blogging didn't generate any income, although I had a place for advertising somewhere. Like <laughs> someone would pay like ten dollars advertise here. But no, yeah, mainly yeah, it was that radio, uh, that radio gig, and then obviously the show still goes on. Um, I got into you know from 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 that to hosting events to becoming an MC. That's definitely also a source of income that I didn't know how I got into. Cause I love hip hop as a culture, but I'm also as an MC, I like to host. And my style of hosting is way different than, um, than a lot of people in terms of very hype. I remember hosting an MC, uh, a ceremony in Saudi and it's very, very royal, really royal. And uh, I still remained in a way who I am. At one point there was one of the royal families, you know, Prince just sitting there. And I just wanted to, everyone seemed to be tensed. And I just wanted to try something. And what I did was very simple, like nothing crazy. I just did Samul Amir, like, you know, your highness, like this or like this, everything okay? And he's like, and everyone started cracking up. Assalamu like, <laughs> alaikum, everybody. No, 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 no. You know, everyone's chill, you know? And that's what people don't understand. Sometimes people like, the, the, the royal or what, what, they're humans at the end of the day, you know? Just, so that happened with me a lot of times. I'm not saying take it extra, but I'm just saying my vibe. One time I went with a bandana on stage and there was one and they loved that. They came to me afterwards and they said, that's so refreshing to see someone being themselves on stage. I'm like, great. Cause the event organizer was like, don't take the bandana. Don't put the bandana. It's not oh. like who I am. Like I like wearing it, you know? So yeah, stuff like that really like shaped who I am as a, from revolt, <laughs> the small blog that started to where I am right now. It's just interesting. That's amazing. And <clears throat> so when did you get into, now you produce music as e well. Executive produce. Executive produce. What's the difference? Great question. And and again, very important for people to know. So uh, you have, um, and I got into that in the pandemic a year and a half ago. I, I wanted to get songs together because I know a lot of people. I have a lot of connections from producers who produce beats to rappers, to graphic designers, to videographers. I'm like, mm, let's put things together. And the, it took the pandemic to let me think like that. An executive producer is someone who kind of manages the whole project. Someone who get the rapper A, rapper B, rapper C, uh, producer, get the beat, um, you know, send it to an engineer, mix it and master it. Like you're supervising everything. Get the artwork done, um, distribution, um, put it on distribution. If there's a video, come up with videos to do it. So alhamdulillah, I think I have 13 or 14 records. I'm so proud of myself. It's freaking awesome. Putting it together. Arabic, uh, mainly centered about Arabic rap, uh, did did just incredible things. And it's so hard because it's a lot of egos as well to deal. I like to do ciphers or like a lot of, like a lot of rappers being involved. I don't, I don't is do- Is that what a cipher is? It's exactly. like a, a montage? A cipher is usually it's a, a, a song that has at least three rappers and more. 
uh, it's a circle, you know, and it's a unity thing. And when you have a cipher, you have one beat and you have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rappers. Uh, it can go up. Um, so I like to do a lot of that because it's more like a continuation. It's a diversity of things. I like to connect, you know, East and West. I like to connect even between us as Arabs, you know, uh, Bilad al-Sham, Levant with the GCC. Um, uh, Egypt has been going crazy for the past three years in terms of they discovered their sound, which I'm very proud of. That's one thing that was lacking in the region. What's the sound? Egypt with using the the whole um, Shabi Maharagan um, kind of element and vibe figured out their sound, um, which was amazing. And if I'm telling you, if people in in the West or in America hear this stuff, they would go insane. <laughs> and it's been happening. You know, Timbaland has been one of the most incredible iconic producers. Listens a lot to Arabic music and actually sampled. No way. Yeah, sampled a lot of Arabic music. You know, um, you know from Warda and others like sampled a lot Timbaland. So, um, and Abdel Halim as well. So now with that sound, it's very close that we can definitely reach something. And that's why I keep saying Sudan, oh my God. When you talk about Sudan, I got to highlight Sudan alone because Sudan, the creativity coming out of Sudan is insane. It's insane. I'm, t I'm telling you, remember, when you hear this, you're probably going to like see that the number one artist in the world is probably Sudanese. Mark my words, two years they're, they're going to take over. That amount of talent and authenticity is incredible. But what's going to put Sudan like that in that level is the people that show love. They're crazy. Put any event over here related to Sudan, people would show up. They love, they, they love Sud like their culture, which is beautiful to see. Sarah, they inspire me. So yeah, I got into that, of course, and it's been beautiful. Tell us about the making and like what goes into making one of these tracks. So like uh, Iraq Cypher yeah. or Hena Qahira or Harab. Yani, oh, man, pick, bless pick, you. Pick whichever, pick one of your, the one that comes to mind first and tell us how it happened. Harab is the first song I released. So it was officially like as an executive producer. Uh, it was the Sudan Cypher before that. And this is where I... Uh, kind of got into like kind of, but officially Harib, I got two rappers out of Saudi Arabia uh, and they both were known in this new school kind of energy and vibe. And I wanted to challenge them. So I got an old school beat by Egyptian producer called Big Mo. And I said, I sent it to them. I was like, I'm challenging you. I know you do new school and trappy beats, but this is an old school beat. I'm challenging you as big ass. Can you rock, can you rock on this? They loved it. Um, so the, the, each of them gave me a verse, they sent it through. And then I was like, mm, there's something missing. Elements of hip hop coming, which is scratching. So I hit up my brother, DJ Lethal Skills, who's Lebanese living in Malaysia right now, one of the legends of Arabic hip hop. One of the very few turntablists that we have. When I say turntablists, you know that scratching sound? He's, in, he's a master at that. Scratches beautifully, you know, on the vinyls. So I sent him the record. He's like, I'm going to do something beautiful with this. Incredible. Just watch. And bam. And he did. He created a, a he created a, some of a bridge using the, the scratching. Came up with the incredible, uh, obviously, artwork uh, with Egyptian illustrator Noura Zed, uh, who's, oh, who's a fan, of course. Yeah, so, she's illustrated then, a bunch of course, Ukrainian yeah, cultures. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. She done She's done a lot of my work. And um, yeah, uh, and we released it. And, and now, to be honest with you, anyone listening, it's very easy to release things because you go to any of these distribution websites, you have the artwork, you have the music, the song, upload, goes to Spotify, and Rami, Apple Music, uh, Deezer, whatever, it goes everywhere. Simple, you don't need a middleman, you need someone to put, you know, it's not CDs, people are listening to streaming. So that really helped a lot. Um, down the line, because I was consistent as well, I, I made a deal with Empire, one of the biggest distribution companies in the world. They've distributed for Kendrick Lamar and Snoop Dogg yeah, and others, dude. and they're an incredible record label as well. Uh, yeah, so now I, I, I release under them. Incredible just to see that. You see? He says casually. That's amazing. No, but that, that is amazing. From somebody who used to like say uh, radio host from in the bedroom to to this now. I don't take this for granted not one second. Believe me, I really, deep inside, I'm a very emotional person. I'm very, very emotional. I get, um, but I don't take anything for granted. It's all, you know, the blessings of, of God and, and Allah, the way, Really, he lightened my path by giving me incredible people, amazing partner with my wife. She helped me a lot. Like she has, you know, the, 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 the Um Ahmed is someone I, um, you know, Hanan, my wife is, wow. Like just, there's nothing I can say that we'll stay here for another day, for sure. Uh, she saved me as well in incredible way at dark times in my life. And uh, um, Ahmed, my son, the people around me, uh, 
KC, you know? <laughs> if you don't know KC by now, shame on you. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful journey so far. And it's only going to get better. Um, tell, tell us about how you and Hanan met. Oh, we're going there. I didn't see that coming. Okay. Ah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, my one and only. It, okay. It was, it was on a, it was on a website called High Five. Back then, none of you guys would know this. Do you know High Five? Yeah. Oh my God. No one knows High Five. Well, if you know High Five, you're a legend. So it was a website where people meet. And it was like one of these, not dating, but it was like your profile. You know, you put your profile there. And I'm just chilling in an internet cafe in Saudi, in Jeddah. And uh, yeah, that's why I, my friends forced me to make a profile. I'm not into that stuff, to be honest. Like I'm not like, I made a profile. The first lady I see was, 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 was Hanan. And I was like, you know, we well, chatted. How old are you? When was that? 2000 and, uh, f 2004. Okay. Yeah. 2004. And so we start that first interaction. We spoke for six hours. Over chat. Over chat. There's, Cause there's no voice call. No, 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 no. At, this time. Chat. at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I'll tell you about the voice call in a second, but chat music, trance music. She's into trance and techno music. and like into, you know, like, and again, remember that's way before I, I do my, you know, things. Um, yeah. This is before you got into hip hop. And, exactly. And rap. So yeah. I was like, listen to whatever. So we got into talking music. It was mainly very music centric as well. A lot of music. Like, what do you like listening to? And five, six hours. I had the job the next day. So it was like 12 or 11.30 PM in the internet cafe. And I finished at 6, 6.30. And I went to work that day. I fell in love. I knew what I felt. Um, I, I, I felt like this is, inc I never felt like this before in my life. I don't know what this feeling is. Never, you know, again, inside Arabia is also a place back then. It was very hard to meet people. Um, I didn't know what to really expect, but this person, this human being connected with in an incredible way. So we started talking and, and the daily thing became really daily. <laughs> Every single day, I can't, get, I can't, there's no way we start talking until I think about- On high five? Yeah, 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 it was, it went from high five to MSN messenger. Then after, if you remember, and yeah. And then I think, I think four, five weeks later, we said, I want to hear your voice. Cause it was not like, there was another thing. Like I want to, I'm very excited. And again, I went to a, a place back then, the international call cabins was very famous in Saudi. Um, you go to the cabin and you dial international call and you call. Where was she living? Uh, she, uh, so my wife is Lebanese. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. My wife is Lebanese. Sorry, I didn't mention that. She's in Beirut and I'm in Jeddah. And uh, yeah, uh, five, six weeks later, decided to have the courage to call her. <laughs> and I did. And, you know, obviously my name is Has Hassan. And she's like, Hassan in the beginning. She said, yeah. Hassan. I'm like, no, it's Hassan. Oh, like I was debating. What is it? And yeah. I loved her voice and we just connected. And I, to sum it up, I felt a strong connection. Um, so I wanted to move. To, to Beirut. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and then you started school. No, no, I did. I did. I, want, I wanted to relocate. Uh. So that, that last, I think it was uh, 2007. No, no, no. 2000 and uh, no, no, way, way before. Sorry. Um, I'm getting the, the dates mixed, but it was before. I moved to Beirut, I'm not moved, relocated because I wanted to be with Hanan. <laughs> Very strong in terms of what I'm feeling. So yeah, but that also shock, sh shocked her in a way that was like, what, you know? <laughs> I, I think I came off like a little bit, yo, Wes, what? You know, it was like that. And I, I didn't know, like I'm revolt, right? Like again, it's been there, this thing, <laughs> even before I launched it. Um, we became very good friends, I would say that. And still are. I think this is what makes it. So in the beginning it was that, and then there was not resistance, but there was like a, oh my God, what happened? It was like a, a very overwhelming. And I stayed in Beirut and then we became friends, we started talking. She was studying graphic design in a university. I used to come to university and just have a chat, just talk, you know, and just have a conversation. Um, yeah, and we became very good friends. And then the, the friendship became a relationship and uh, yeah someone who saved my life like many times and still is. Tell us the story about how you guys got married. Oh man. Okay. So I'm Saudi. My wife is Lebanese. And, and, and back then I think till now, Saudis cannot marry non-Saudis without approval mm. from the government. It, it is the, the thing. 
I'm like, oh man, I want to get, I want to marry this woman. Like, uh, you know, خلاص, um, it was a struggle. It was, uh, it was really a big struggle to get approval to that because you didn't know what the right ways to do it. So I'll just want to, I, I want to say a story that it also, يعني, I, every time I think about it, it's crazy. So you have to go through a certain process. And I thought that the easiest process is to get something called a'fa or an approval from the prince directly. And something that they do in Saudi every now and then is that the prince comes in and sits in a, in a hole and people come in with their talab or their thing, whatever they request. And the prince reads it on the spot and either approves it, not approves it. It's a thing, man. You know, that's really cool. <laughs> Very cool. Um, Did you put a PowerPoint presentation? No, that was like an actual paper. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting. So I walk in very nervous. I'm wearing the thobe and just, you know, just excited. I'm, I'm like, baby, let's go. I'm going to get that approval to get married. <laughs> you know? Okay. So I walked in. Everyone is nervous and everyone is obviously having their, their one, someone wants money, someone wants land, someone wants to get married, a lot of things. So my turn come in and it's the prince. Uh, incredible, incredible guy. He's a poet as well. Like he, you know, and um, so there's security behind him, like three, four guards and he's sitting in Prince and so I gave him, and they say before, do not speak until you're spoken to. Mm. They tell you that. So it's not like a chat, like, you know, how you doing, sir? Like, no, <laughs> no none of that. So man, oh my God. So I gave him the paper and I just say, stay quiet, right? So what, he reads what, it. What was on the paper? The paper is like, you know, me, Hassan, Ahmed with my passport number with a Saudi is is willing to, uh, uh, wanted to grant, if you can grab me the approval to marry uh, Hanan, na, 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 Lebanese, her passport. Uh, uh, she lived in Jeddah. Um, uh, she's one of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you put things, I, I think, you know, you, you say like, she's the one I want to marry, all that. Great. And then it's a small page, uh, paragraph. And then you sign it and you give it. Um, he reads it and it was like a, a minute or so he's reading and then he puts it down his glasses like that and he's like, why do you love her? I said, yeah, why do you want to marry her? He said, so my answer was like, I swear to God, I panicked. I don't know what to say. What am I going to say to this, you know, royal person and prince? What, what can I possibly say? I swear to God, I panicked. It stays like five seconds. I'm not doing it. So it came out. It's like, I have her. I love her. And he's like, <laughs> and everyone else was laughing. And the whole room was laughing bad shui, you know, like, <laughs> and he signed. I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he signed. <laughs> so I went out and he said, uh, approved, but hasab shurut. Mm. According to the laws or whatever back then, you know, you had to live in Saudi a certain time. It got complicated, Yanni Shui, you know. But that's the story I always find funny. I had to find a lawyer that to go in and, and find another approval ways and I got again. But the way I said the to the prince, it was one word. The way he laughed was like, I don't know if it deep inside I, I thought that he's a poet, he liked poetry, he'll feel like some sort of I don't know what to say. Like I didn't I, Afterwards, there's a million things I could have said. Like, you know, she's a good woman. She will, you know, I was like, Ahibha? Like, you love her? <laughs> I do, but I mean, and she's like, you said that to the prince? Like, yeah. <laughs> and he approved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just, um, that's yeah. That's an awesome story. Yeah, yeah, that's just massive, you know? And um, um, I got to say something about that quickly. Um, so Hanan has a, has a big, amazing family. And at that point, my family is really like, Um, I want to talk about the concept of family. Like, so when I got into her, into her family, they embraced me really beautifully. And I saw like that, and that gave me a lot of amazing feeling as well. You know, cousins of cousins and people and distant relatives. I didn't have that a lot. Our family was very um, distant. A lot of, lot of them in, in, in America, in, in Brazil, in, in you know, um, Canada. Everyone is kind of everywhere. And we were the only ones in Saudi You know, so th that also instilled that love. I saw everybody coming in, what coming in. I'm like the strange guy, right? Coming into this uh, very, uh, you know, I'm this guy who like speaks English more, Arabic. Yeah, even, it was, you know, I communicated actually with English, English, Arabi, Kharbatan. People get, <laughs> you know, confusing sometimes. But yeah, um, so yeah, they, they took me in and it's been just uh, beautiful, you know.
Yeah, when you know the the phrase "the better half," definitely the better half for sure. <laughs> she's she's my better half for sure, um, and uh, done incredible work, you know, and always helps me. Um, we have this Revolt magazine, if I may say, like here, <laughs> and she's the graphic designer for that magazine. No way. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, the design of it and stuff like that. And so she's like my one, yeah, one. That's why I'm saying best friends. She knows, she, she's, I think, the only human being on earth that truly knows who Hassan is. And that's a beautiful thing because I don't, I'm not that person where she, she knows everything about me. And uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. Oh, Mohammed, I love you. <laughs> 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 I made it. I'm Casey. <laughs> Um, I love that. Uh, okay. Uh, when you look back on your really beautiful and winding journey, if you could tell young Hassan some lessons that you've learned throughout the process, what would you want the younger version of yourself to know, knowing everything that you know now? Hmm. You know what's interesting about that and salute to you? I always ask that question and I always expect a certain answer from people when I interview people. I don't get asked a lot of that question. And it's always the answer is like, I'm thinking about it and I want to be as frank as possible. What would I tell the younger me? Um, I think more like, maybe don't think, don't take things too personally. Because I used to take everything personally. I used to take everything. No, they don't want me. I'm not getting validation. Small things used to put me down a lot. And I used to go, you know, back to, to you know, obviously my wife who pushes me or like a Chuck D situation or like that kid. There's always situations that boosted me. And I would say don't. And now that I'm, I'm there now, but I would say the younger guy, but it's hard. I get it. You're young and, and things like that really either break you or make you sometimes. So there's a, and I'll be extra honest. I really truly think I'm not talented. Like when I say, I don't have a talent. Like you're not sitting here with a producer or a rapper or a, a poet or someone who plays the oud. Like seriously. When I, so I know that from within me. Now people see me as passionate. Great. I am passionate about what I do, but I'm more like a voice. So the real talent is the artist I bring together. Like the artist is like, okay, Tad. Come. So at a lot of periods of my time, I used to go like this, right? Down, up, go. Down, go, up, go. Guess what happened? I remain where I am. I didn't go up. So no one from these artists as well pulled me up with them, if that may say. And down the line, I met two guys who were incredible in my in my, in my life and connected with one. Oh, one of them was um, um, Bobby to and Stretch Church and Bobby to one of the biggest hip hop radio shows in college. And they did in America, they've hosted Biggie, Tupac, and it was a college FM. They had the same passion. So I met them here in Dubai, which was amazing. I met Sway. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Sway. He had a show called Sway in the morning, incredible guy, very pioneer in hip hop. Uh, we had a conversation and we always talk about that. Guess what's the common thing between these two radio hosts? They've had a lot of also help from the rappers who also made it big. Yeah. I didn't have that. So I don't know. That's why I'm telling you, it's like more like a therapy th session. Cause like, what would I say? is like, don't take things personally, you know? Cause I used to do that a lot. Ta, 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 ta. But, you know, did I go up? I, I don't know. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm at a place where I'm very, people really appreciate and respect my opinion, which is amazing to be, but I think I could be way bigger. Like way, and I have that dream to become even way more. It's just, I've always wanted to launch my own things. And the number one thing I always tell myself, Hus, you don't have a platform that is big. You've always created platforms. Revolt, I created it. Lesh Hip Hop, I created it. The station was not a big station. They didn't have that force where it's like a big, big radio station. It's a weekly show. They didn't advertise the show. They didn't really push the show, right? So again, um, Worked in here a couple of radio stations as well. Never, I've always been kind of bigger than what the platform I'm in. I worked in a couple of streaming services. My ideologies was bigger that the independent and 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 local regional community. Um, no one wanted to take care to take care of them. You see, it's not like I'm coming in in a big organization or a place and they have all the power in the world and then yalla. I didn't have that. I didn't have the funding. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the, you see, you see how it's shaping up to be who I am. So there's a lot of that thinking as well, but 
people like me need to exist, I guess, in terms of like to make things happen and to, to alert other people about uh, uh, other artists. A lot of people come to know about artists from me and then they finalize a big deal for them, for example, without me knowing. And that's cool. And so that's the culture I'm in. That's the, and I'm very cool with that. I don't have a website, for example. So my A&R is my Instagram. Like I go on Instagram and I post three, four artists, for example, a week and people are like, wow, amazing. And then four or five weeks or five, four months later, you see that person who knows you from him or her and they connected with each other through that Instagram story. I think it's really important for you to know how much of an authority you are on hip hop and rap and Arabic hip hop and rap in the region. Like, please do not underestimate what you've built and the awareness that you've built and the culture that you've grown around it. And you are such a powerful connector, like the, you call it executive producing this, this making of music happen when bringing all the people together. Like that's freaking huge, Hassan, mm. really. And it's I, something to be really proud of. Like when I think of hip hop in the region, the first name I think of is you. Well, really? Bless you. Well, I, uh, it really means a lot because it's a lot of work that gets into it and blessings for that. And again, I always say, and a lot of people like this, but like I'm a mm -hmm. servant of the of the community, of the local and regional. And I say that, I mean it. But sometimes as a human, these things get to you, the concept of validation, the concept of, uh, you know, and I always say, don't ask for validation from nobody, even me. Um, I remember one of the rappers in Saudi who's really blowing up right now. His first record was something along the lines of he had a bar said like, you guys are all dreaming about getting on Lesh Hip Hop. My dream is bigger than that. I got him because he said that. He didn't want my validation. He didn't He didn't think that Lesh Hip Hop is the best thing I can reach. I want bigger for you, my brother or sister. You know, so um, it's, it's very important. Um, what What is bigger for for you? So what, what's what's the dream? Where Where would you like to go, inshallah? So there's a couple of dreams, a festival, an Arab hip hop festival. Yo. You know, a two, yeah. three day Tala's thing. Tala's nodding, yeah. Um, <laughs> producers, graffiti artists, breakers, hip hop culture, but it's Arabi. Come, I'll show you what do we have as Arabs. <laughs> From Egypt to Sudan, to Iraq, to Syria, to Lebanon, to Maghrib, yalla, to the GCC. Come, I'll show you. To the people in the diaspora, focused hip hop, right? getting people from the States to come in here and speak. Yeah, it's a big, big thing. I mean, um, to be honest with you guys, we have Soul DXP, which are doing incredible, like uh, what they do and, uh, you know, but my focus wants to be on Arabic rap. Um, mm. So that's definitely a, a dream. Um, Revolt Magazine is definitely a dream come true to have it printed. Uh, it's there now printed, which is amazing. Um, but the ultimate, ultimate dream and something that maybe ne will never happen, but it's always there, is owning a radio station. Going back to that, kind of owning an FM uh, hip hop radio uh, station that plays that. But that's something that also across the years have have evolved because you realize people are listening to something else right now and the evolution of listening how. Um, podcasts like this, the importance of that. So maybe creating that. So it's 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 also vague when it comes to that, but I want to do something along the lines of, of, of FM, something, I don't know what it is yet, but it's there. But the biggest dream that I have right now is definitely doing a festival and getting into events, doing small events and um, I love that. stuff like that. So definitely being on the ground more and showcasing, because now we have, we got DJs, we got producers, um, you know, we got, uh, you know, I, I got, I got the, 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 the know-how is how to sell an event and how to, you know, how to get the sponsors to an event. So yeah, inshallah. Inshallah. I wish all of that for you, inshallah. <laughs> um, uh, we have a bit of a morbid question that we ask every guest. And it is, um, yeah, many, 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 many years, inshallah, into the future. Uh, what would the one line of your obituary say? Wow. Ooh. Um. A human being that believed in us, you know? Um, someone that saw the light when no one did, right? Someone that, um, someone that, uh, you know, like um, an amazing artist by the name of Odyssey. He's Sudanese American, incredible guy. When I met him here in the UAE, I also flew to, to see him. He's an amazing guy. He said, uh, Has, there's a lot of nicknames about you. He's like, you're, you're like people call you the pillar the big guy, big Haas. He's like, I want to give you a new nickname. 
I'm like, oh, what is it? You know what he said? What did he say? The lighthouse. <laughs> I love that. But what does the, what does the lighthouse do? It's a beacon to guide you home. Yeah, but that's it. But not a lot of people really know it and care about it too much unless there's a problem, <laughs> right? So he's like, I'm like, you see me like, wait, I'm like, yeah, that, that meant a lot. Because the lighthouse is someone like you said. So maybe that's my job, right? Like also I said, like it, 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 you're impacting, but for a period of time and then zoop, you go until another one is missing or whatever. And then, so maybe that what it should say, you know, uh, someone who really, you know, um, loved his family more than anything, uh, you know, and th this is the one thing that kind of hurts the most. Like if we leave this earth, if I leave this earth, what happens to Ahmed? Because he's, he's on the autism spectrum and you go like, how is the world going to treat him? He's not your average typical kid. And that's definitely th something I think about, um, you know, but it's in mot haq, you know, and it's, uh, death is, is coming. And it's, it, it's something that, you know, we have to accept, of course, as humans and Muslims. And yeah, you, you accept that. And, um, but yeah, maybe a lighthouse would be cool. People are like, what do you mean lighthouse? What does that mean? Well, tune in to the current and culture podcast at this moment to understand why he said that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Is there anything we should have asked you? Anything that what? you'd like to say? Are you kidding? Say? This is the best interview I've ever done. Like, or <laughs> chat. I would call that interview. Uh, great soul uh, in you. Great people around me. I feel the energy. Respect to both of you. Um, and respect to the KC uh, current and culture team. And uh, no, I think it's beautiful. It, it really felt like a therapy session. <laughs> really, it does. And, and usually I get told that by artists. I never really felt that because, you know, our job is to ask, right? So you were there listening. You're asked questions that no one asked. Uh, you have a, an incredible vibe and energy. KC means a lot to me. Everything clicked. Um, that means a yeah, lot. Yeah, no, Thank salute. You. There's there's nothing. I just want to say that, you know, obviously don't, don't judge people generally. Like, don't be a judge of... The reason why I say that in the beginning of uh, of our life with Ahmed, a lot of people used to give us a lot of weird things and weird looks and uh, you guys don't know how to raise your kid because he used to have a tantrum, let's say in the middle of the supermarket. And I'm like, but wallahi we do. We really do a lot of work with him. So don't judge because you don't know what that family is going through or what that person. So don't be that, try to be on a, you know, don't look or whatever it is. And, you know, because we used to, a lot of times we used to finish the supermarket, stay in the car, cry for like, you know, like 15, 20 minutes until that goes, because it's difficult. Now we're strong. Sometimes we reply. <laughs> yeah, you should always reply. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so now we got stronger, but blessings to you, really. It's an honor to be on this uh, platform and no. respect to what you guys do. Keep doing what you're doing because it's needed. Could be against the current sometimes, but it's needed because it's a way to elevate uh, the way people perceive information and the storytelling from our region, which is so beautiful, that yeah. reflects us more than any mass media and more than any media. And we are the the people that are listen, that listen to. It's our time. It's our voice. It's been our time. A <laughs> couple of things I like to highlight. Yeah. Um, in, in the Arab region um, and in the world as well, there's a lack of femcees, uh, rappers who happen to be obviously female. I'm very vocal about Mathy male or female mm. is talent. I got into a lot of arguments with people, like she's good for a female. I'm like, nah, I, I really straight up with that. So two things I want to say here. One, try to create more projects that has and include obviously sisters, but do that in the right way. Don't include them just because you want to include them at a check mark. Very vocal about that. Yeah. Um, that's one. Two, for the brothers out there, men, create a safe space for women to flourish. It's our responsibility as men to create a safe space. I've been around and I've seen some, some things that's not cool. So create that space. And if your friend as a man is doing something, call him out. I said so. Put it in me. Let him fight me. Okay? <laughs> because it's really, I felt that this is the best way to talk about it. And you see me how I got my tone up a little bit because I'm sick and tired of, I've been around. Whether it's a, a female director, a, it's a society without women is not a, it's not a society period. Like, you know, I'm not saying this as an, we need to, as men, we need to create that safe space because I've been around and many in other uh, countries and in the world as men create that safe space where women can flourish and work and prove their talent and showcase their talent. Do, do not go like this and that. You know what I'm talking about. So don't. And if you know somebody that does that, 
call them out. It's your job as a man. It's, it's, it's not, no one else's job, by the way. Like it's, it's our job. So I'm very vocal. That being said, I created something called the Arab FMC Cypher, where I, I got five incredible sisters that rapped, got on the mic and then bam, you know, English and Arabic. And I'm, uh, I want to tell you here, and I'm working on another one right now that is massive, incredible as well. And there's a concept here though. The, con the song is going to be called the Heb. The Heb? Heb. Nice. Why is it Heb? How many times we hear that word, right? Especially as sisters, sadly, right? As women. How many? So the, the, usually I don't have a theme for all my records, but that's the first record when the producer sent it to me, there was a sample of the word Heb and it inspired me and... It's an incredible record. Uh, it's been put together now as we speak. I have two verses. There's going to be four or five women on this, or maybe six even. Incredible names. I'm so excited. And uh, yeah, uh, that's something I'm definitely working on. And I'm working on a couple of ciphers. Um, Syria cipher is in the works. Sudan cipher part two is in the works. You guys are the <laughs> first one to, to, to know. But it takes a lot of time. These ciphers take a lot of time because it's a lot of egos and a lot of when are you recording? They're not making money off this as well. Like it's not, it's more cultural, right? And it's more about when is your verse going to come through? When is this going to, so I'm very excited. I'm very, very excited. The, the future looks uh, really um, uh, dope. That's amazing. And where can people uh, follow you and find find out more about you? Yeah. Um, big Huss on, on Instagram or big underscore Huss and uh, YouTube. Um, my blog is still active. I'll show you my first. The Revolt blog? Yeah, the Revolt. Yeah. I'll, show, I'll show you my first post at revolt, revoltradio.blogspot.com. Still there. No website. People are like, Blogspot? I'm like, <laughs> Blogspot, baby. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, but yeah, I'm on socials usually on, on, on Big House, mainly, mainly Instagram and um, trying to be on TikTok. I'm failing <laughs> miserably. I don't understand TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. No, but maybe T can help out. Tala's going to teach yeah, us. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, bless, you know. So yeah, uh, and the email is something I use a lot, believe it or not. Email more than the Instagram DM. So if you want to reach me more, email. I'm more connected to it.